broken within Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Blood of 
Jesus Christ, oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Just our voices on that chorus. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Pastor. Well, the book of 1 John tells us that truth, that it was only the precious blood of Christ. Peter calls it that, it's the precious blood. John tells us that it was by propitiation. It was propitiation, the doctrine where Jesus covered our sin with his blood and thereby satisfied the wrath of God, the, the wrath of God upon sin. And certainly, uh, what a great truth that is. Thank you for the good music, and we enjoy singing for the Lord. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1. We want to consider a particular truth out of the book of Hebrews, and, and I think it's applicable for you and I today as we consider our role in an ever-changing world. We think about the church and and how the church, again, to without compromising, continues to adapt and continues to be efficient and effective in our culture. And uh, I mean, let's face it, folks, uh, most of the world today has a negative outlook against Christianity. Uh, it's a world, an outlook that seems as if it's maybe a bit outdated. You know, it's not really very relevant in a lot of people's minds. Uh, again, I shared with you a couple of weeks ago that uh, the millennial generation, uh, 87% of 78 million uh, millennials are not connected to any kind of religion. That's a shocking number. And uh, what it begins to signify and it typifies that there's the response to Christianity uh, is, is ever beginning to wane even more. There's lots of reasons, lots of debates. Obviously, you boil it down to the individual and their need for Christ and the church's ability with the gospel uh, to make a difference in a person's life. I still believe without question, the Bible is all we need. Do you believe that this morning? The Bible's it. God is it. He is what changes men's life. It's not our services and not our schedule and not our location and not our buildings, you know. None of that. Uh, all that is good or whatever, but in the end, what changes men's life is the Lord. Now, in terms of the church and the effectiveness of the church, some predict that in 20 years uh, that the church will look completely different than what it does today. We like our Sunday morning, you know, 1015. We like our Sunday morning Sunday school, and we like our, you know, uh, convenient and efficient service schedule. Uh, some predict that if things continue, uh, when the millennial generation, who are now as old as 35, in the next 15 to 20 years, when they're 50, 55, and their children are having children, uh, then what's that generation going to look like for the Lord Jesus Christ and or for religion in general? And many predict that the church will look very different. Yeah, they'll say it looks different because uh, maybe of how we do things. You know, the methods in which we have chosen to employ uh, over the, 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 the years, the centuries even, in some cases. Uh, maybe it'll look different in terms of the faces. I don't know. Uh, many of them project that it will be much smaller. If the current trend sets continually, then that 87% who are not going to church when they're 50, 55, most of the rest of us will already be dead. What will the church look like then? A church of 100 may be the church of 10. 
You know, the church of a thousand, maybe the church of a hundred. The point being uh, that things are changing, things are morphing. And again, I don't want to lose heart. I don't want to paint a terrible picture. Here's the reality. We have a living and true God with a powerful and ever-living Bible that is more than enough to grab a hold of any man or woman's heart and bring them to Christ. We absolutely, we have more than enough. In our faith, one of the questions you need to ask yourself, and I need to ask myself is, is our faith strong enough, staunch enough, to believe in that what we are doing and what message we have in our hand is enough to change the world in which we live? By the way, that's a challenging thought. The predominant idea of millennials, and it's, I'm not just preaching on millennials, that's just the, the, the case in point. The predominant feeling of many of the millennials is they want to be world changers. They want to change the world. They want, they want the world to be better than what was handed to them. And uh, by the way, that, that's kind of the predominant thought through the last three or four or five generations. The predominant thought philosophy is in a family is, I want my kids to have more and better than I did. That's kind of the prevailing philosophy, Christian or non-Christian. I read it just a couple of days ago. I was reading an article. I've seen it on Facebook in the last week. I've read books about this. Again, where I've seen reports and testimonies and articles, all kinds of things, where we just kind of have this prevailing idea. By the way, it's the American way. That I, my life is about giving my children more and making their life better than what I had. And so it's no surprise that this new generation, this new powerful populist generation uh, is one that has in mind, I want to change the world. The world needs changing. The world needs to be better. And oh, by the way, I think as Christians, we would agree with that too. Amen. The world needs changing. Maybe the definition is a little bit different. We believe it needs to be changed with Jesus Christ and only by Jesus Christ. I'm not sure that's the prevailing philosophy uh, moving forward uh, just in the, the generations to come. And we've got to ask ourselves again, what do we believe in? And so I was reading in Hebrews the other day and a verse really just came off the page. And, and the Lord asked me to preach it to you this morning and share it with you. And it's about the scepter of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've titled the message this morning, Hold Out the Scepter. How many of you know what a scepter is? Anybody know what that is? Let's reverse the question. Don't know what a scepter is. Be willing to be, answer honestly. Don't know what a scepter is. All right, again, that's amazing. Most of you don't vote. I guess that's normal, huh? The scepter, let me give you a quick look. The scepter was typically a, 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 a wand, a stick, um, some type of staff, possibly, probably in the range of uh, maybe a meter, two to three uh, feet long, something like that. Typically, it was an ornate uh, stick or, or uh, staff of some sort, and typically gold or ornated with jewels and things some, such as that. You find them in the Bible, they belong to kings, the king's scepter. And the scepter was a picture of power and authority. Obviously, belonging to kings, it really had all power and all authority in the realm of the king. The scepter was typically used uh, in, in a way that maybe you're familiar, uh, where uh, one who would come before the king unannounced. The king had power uh, to give live or die. How many of you have seen that situation? Maybe in the Roman Colosseum or some type of gladiator situation where the emperor or the Caesar would have within his ability a life or death. And the scepter was not only a picture of the sovereignty and authority and power of the ruler, the king, but it was also an issue where he could have life and death at his fingertips. One who would come before the king, again unannounced, had to have the scepter held out to them as a symbol of acceptance. I am willing to hear what you have to say. I'm going to allow you to be in my presence. Matter of fact, throughout history, throughout the kingdoms of the world, most kings are revered as deity. One of the great examples of that was Nebuchadnezzar. In Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar was considered a god. Uh, when he uh, calls for the three Hebrew children to be cast in the furnace, it was because they blasphemed himself without bowing and worshiping to him as a god and to his image. So the king would often be viewed as deity before men. 
Therefore, anything uh, that was not acceptable, he would either hold out the scepter and you would live, or he would withhold the scepter and you were commanded to die. His requirement for not holding out the scepter was that now uh, you've just risked your life and you're going to die. One of the great stories of the scepter is in the book of Esther. How many of you know the book of Esther? We just finished some Wednesday night teaching on the book of Esther. What a wonderful story and book and truth the story of Esther is. On two occasions in the book of Esther, Esther, who was the king's wife, she was the queen, but she too approached the king unannounced and not called for. The king didn't summon her, and she came on two occasions before King Ahasuerus. Those of you who like history, Ahasuerus is the Xerxes of history. Many of you know the man by the name of Xerxes. Two occasions she came before him, and it's found, first of all, in chapter number 4 and verse 11, as Mordecai, her uncle slash father, uh, would say to her, you have got to go to the king, and you have got to request of him our needs. And Esther tells Mordecai, you know the consequences. You know the situation that if I go in there without being called for and he doesn't hold out the scepter, my life is going to be over. Death is the result. And it's not just the pleasure of the king to kill those who do not receive the scepter. She said in Esther 4 verse 11 that it's a law. It's the law of the king in, in Persia, in Babylon at that time, uh, that, that if you don't have the scepter, then the law requires of you that you would be dead. Esther, in her courage, as you know the story, goes before King Ahasuerus to implore him and beseech him for her people, for Israel, for there was a death, a death law passed upon the people of Israel. Hold out the scepter. Esther says to Mordecai, if it doesn't hold out the scepter, I'm going to die. And of course, we most of us know the, the words of, of Mordecai. He said, but who knows that you haven't come into the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows, but whether you've come into the kingdom as the queen in all of Persia, that you would now be there and arrived at that location for such a time as this, that you would be the one chosen of God to intercede for and plead the case of God Almighty. Now, I bring that story up because we find that same imagery in the book of Hebrews. And I want to submit to you this morning, who knows that you and I, but what you and I as Christians are not in the kingdom at this time, on this day, in these occasions, under these circumstances, by which God has not placed us here and allowed us to be here for the needs of the kingdom around us. You and I hold an incredible position. And that is that we are ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that our need to tell men, our need to tell men in an ever-changing world, in a world where religion seems to be waning, where a heart for God and a consideration of God as even a viable option begins to wane away. God said, but that's why I've got you there. That's why you're living today. That's what your life is about. That you would be the one to hold out the scepter. Now consider from Hebrews chapter 1. Pick it up in verse number 3 there. In our text, verse 3, Paul, uh, the, the, many believe it's Paul, who's the author of Hebrews, says in verse 3 that God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he hath made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. By the way, can I get an amen right there? When you read the book of Hebrews, Hebrews is a very ornate book. It, the, the words are incredible. And it talks about the superiority of Christ in every measure, and certainly in the human world and in the angelic world as well. Christ, folks, is superior to everything and everyone else. Now, what he says here that God has spoken to us in these last days. Well, we've heard that message. 
The message has been being preached now for about 2,000 years. The last days refers to the New Testament age, that time of the church, where the church has been given by God, the great gospel message. And we've been talking about it now for a couple thousand years. And the message is this, that Christ is superior and Christ trumps everything else. That's why John 14 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father but by me. That's the practical application of verse 3 and 4 here from Hebrews. There's only one way to get to heaven. And the reason that is is because Christ is superior to everything and everyone else. Now in that, we begin, there's a discussion here in this first chapter beginning in verse number 4. And the discussion begins to go to the comparisons between Christ and the angelic world. There are some today, I think, who get caught up in the angelic world. And what I mean by that is, I don't mean just the study of it or the, the inquisitive nature of angels. And what I mean is that they tend to lean a little bit more toward angels than they do just the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, we, we allow angels to become such a powerful influence, we sometimes lose the effect of the power of Jesus Christ and the Word of God in our life. Now, by the way, I can't wait to meet Michael. And I can't wait to hear Gabriel. And I can't wait to meet all the other angels that God has created. By the way, I think we're going to have a chance one of these days, no doubt, to see Lucifer himself. And I don't necessarily want to meet him. I wouldn't mind looking at him. I don't want to talk to him. Actually, I've talked to him several times. Amen. The reality of the angelic world and what he begins to establish in verse 4, 5, 6, and 7 is that God has given his son the, the, the premier place in not only in the angelic world, but he's given Christ the premier place in the human world as well. Now pick it up with me in verse number 8. Let's, let's grab these two verses here. And he says unto the Son, but he unto the Son he saith. Again, the previous verses he had said, he addresses what he had said unto the angelic beings. But unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. By the way, we ought to say amen right there. The kingdom of God is forever and forever. Uh, a scepter, there's the word, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. That phrase just jumped off the page as I was reading. The word scepter caught my attention. It's only used a handful of times uh, in the scripture. And as I just related the story of Esther, many times the scepter is a bit of a negative look. Clearly, clearly a hazardous Xerxes, whatever you want to call him, he had the power really of the most powerful throne and empire on the planet at the time. There were no rivals to his power and his authority in the world at the time. And yet we read about that story of Esther and Ahasuerus, and yet we start thinking about, man, he must have been a really powerful guy. But let's be honest, there is no scepter of power and authority like unto our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is a scepter of righteousness, and it is a scepter of righteousness, and it's the scepter of righteousness of the kingdom of which our Savior indeed is king. Now you remember... Remember the story of Nicodemus uh, there in John chapter 3? He told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he really told him two things, two important truths about the kingdom. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. By the way, that, that tells us right there that if you're saved this morning, if you've been born again, then you ought to be able to see the kingdom. I mean, you ought to be able to see this thing of which we are a part of, and it's the kingdom of God. In verse 5 of John chapter 3, he tells him another important truth about the kingdom. He says, if, unless a man be born of water and of spirit. That, now, by the way, that's two simple things. Except a man be born physically and be born again spiritually, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, by the way, God has a gatekeeper. God has a gatekeeper to the kingdom. And the gatekeeper is checking at the door. You know, hey, 
You've been spiritually born again. Clearly you've been born physically. You're living, breathing air on the earth. But the question is, you can't come into the kingdom. You can't join the kingdom. You can't participate in the kingdom. You can't see the kingdom. You can't ha have the blessings of the kingdom unless you've been spiritually born again by the power and the spirit of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Now that truth about the kingdom. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the Lord Jesus Christ sitting on a throne. You know, we don't have the Lord sitting in Jerusalem, literally sitting on a throne in the temple in Jerusalem. But oh, by the way, let's remind ourselves, he will one of these days. I read, again, read through the Isaiah 11, uh, uh, Jeremiah 23. You read, you read uh, Revelation 19. You read the passages that talk about the rule and the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ, that millennial kingdom, when he literally will sit on a throne in, in, the, in the temple in Jerusalem. And oh, by the way, we're going to get to be there. Amen. Well, Luke chapter 17, verse 20, 21, gives us some insight. Part of our struggle this morning about this kingdom idea. A scepter of the kingdom is a scepter of righteousness. Part of our struggle today is the reality that we don't live in a physical kingdom, we're living in a spiritual kingdom. Uh, in other words, I wish we had uniforms of those that are in the kingdom. You know, I wish we had numbers and names on our jerseys and I wish they said OU on the front. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what's wrong with that. The Lord's from Oklahoma. And he moved to Texas. <laughs> yeah, but he was a missionary, amen. He's a missionary. <laughs> By the way, wouldn't it be great if the kingdom, when you walk in, in life, we just see, hey, there's a believer. There's a believer, right? I mean, it's just easy as uh, understanding the, the, the uniform. But the, Luke, the book of Luke says that the kingdom now, the kingdom of God is within you. It's the king of your heart. It's the king of your life. And that's why now we have a struggle where we may have a king on the throne of our heart, but he doesn't necessarily drive the vehicle of the body if we're not careful. I wish God would steer the body. You know, I wish God would just take charge and I would just become a non-issue, a non-participant. But that's not the way God does it. God wants you to serve him faithfully. And he wants you to serve him passionately. And he wants you to serve him most of all. He wants you to serve him willingly. And the point of the kingdom, the kingdom of righteousness and the scepter of the kingdom of which we'll be held out, that future condition. And Hebrews, the context of Hebrews is very clearly the kingdom to come. It's a kingdom of righteousness. Read Isaiah chapter 11, verses three through about verse seven, eight. Read through there God's description of the kingdom of Christ. Read, read through there as God describes not just the kingdom itself, but the king himself. Read about the king. He is a king of righteousness. He's a, a king of purity and holiness and truth. He is a king of rightness in this world. God has a king to come. That's why the Bible describes it. And what's an interesting look here is that in the Bible, the, the, word, uh, the word scepter in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8 is the same Greek word as in Revelation 2 and 27, where in that passage, the Bible says that the king will rule with a rod of iron. How many have heard that phrase before in the scripture? He'll rule with a rod of iron. That describes the kingdom to come. That describes the future millennial kingdom where God will rule. That there will be no disobedience that will carry itself out to rebellion. Now, there's going to be some disobedience. There will be those who won't agree with God, but God will quickly correct them and God will quickly bring them in line. It's a rod of iron. It's a scepter of righteousness. God won't tolerate. In the end of time, all unrighteousness will be dealt with. All unrighteousness will suffer the wrath of God. Without placing their belief in God, God will deal with that unbelief. He'll deal with that unrighteousness through a scepter of righteousness and the offer will be rescinded. 
There will be no extension of a scepter to say, hey, I accept you for what you are. Because of your unbelief and your lack of believing in Christ, you will die and spend eternity separated from God. You will die and spend eternity in the lake of fire. God says the receptor is rescinded. Are right, you following my thoughts this morning? There's a scepter. It's a scepter that you and I have within our responsibility today. It's a scepter of which 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 says that we are ambassadors of Christ. Verse 19 says that we have the ministry of reconciliation. God says to the church today, hey, I got a job for you. I need you to go out and I need you to hold out the scepter to the world. Let them know that I'm a king of righteousness. People are disillusioned about the church. Let's be, make sure we, we make a, a, a distinction that needs to be grabbed a hold of, and that is this. Though people in the church are still human and still make mistakes, the God of the church does not make mistakes. The God of the church is still a righteous king. He is still a holy God. There in verse 8, God said unto the Son, O oh God, you see, the king of the kingdom the king of the kingdom is the same as the God of heaven. The king of the kingdom, by his own words, he would say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. And the Father gives testimony to the king, and he calls him God. Many today want to debate whether Christ is actually the Savior. The Jews don't accept him. Cults. Don't teach him at all. John calls that the spirit of Antichrist. It's those who teach and believe that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh and that Jesus Christ is not the Savior of the world. By the way, those who would teach that Jesus Christ is not God, they are not to be believed. God calls them the spirit, or calls that the spirit of Antichrist. And you've heard that the spirit of Antichrist should come, and even now, already, is it in the world? It's already here, folks. It's already in the world. And there are those who deny the very king of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. And God declares that the king is indeed God. By the way, uh, how does that do for your faith in an ever-changing world? What's that do for you when... 87% of the youngest generation is telling us that they're not interested in God. Well, what does that do uh, when, when religion itself is ever morphing and ever changing? Not, not to be more like God, it's ever changing. And then it's deciding that the truths of the Bible really can be debated and negotiated and that we can kind of define God how we want to define God. Let me tell you something, my faith in my king rests secure in that he is God himself, he's a king of righteousness, and he has a scepter of power and authority in his hands. There's a kingdom as well. The kingdom which we're a part of. It's a kingdom also of righteousness. I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge myself because God challenged me too. You see, part of the disillusionment about our, the, the current generations and the trends of our world is because they look at the church. Here we go now. They look at the church, this assembly of people called Christians. Here we go now. And they really don't see a difference. They really don't see a difference. And uh, what they see, what the world sees of the church, they see people, number one, that are hypocritical. They say one thing that they believe one thing, but they live something else out. Come on now, is that right or not? I don't know what that looks like. And by the way, so us Christians, here's what we say to that. Well, we're human, right? I mean, I've, I've been to church all my life, and i just full of people who are human. And we're people who have flaws. And we're people who are not perfect yet. And by the way, we all say amen to that. Because we all would probably should acknowledge that we're probably the biggest hypocrite there is. By the way, uh, just a quick mark. You know one of the good marks of a hypocrite? Is pointing fingers at everybody else believing that they're worse than they are. And of course nobody does that. Nobody points fingers. Nobody says, well, dude. Brother Terry's got an orange shirt on today. Everybody knows that's the color of hell. 
Spiritual people don't do that. And I'm not going to say anything about that other university here in the state. <laughs> By the way, OU is crimson red. The blood of Christ, amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you can't deny that. Nobody says, nobody says in the open, I don't think Brother Terry spirits because of an orange shirt. That, that's a ridiculous thought. But nobody, nobody thinks hypocrisy is ever involved in their life. And the reality is that the generation said, hey, there's a big problem in the church. The righteousness of the church is a problem. There are people who say they believe one thing, but their life acts something different. And they don't want to come to church. They don't believe in the Bible. They don't think the power of the Bible is enough to change a man because they don't see any samples of that. Now, by the way, I would suggest this. There are plenty of samples. There are plenty of examples there are plenty of people who love the Lord Jesus Christ and who have a heart for God, who want to strive, as Matthew 5 says about verse 5, for those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first. There are plenty of people who I know and who I believe have a pure heart before God that though they live in a flawed human body, they have a spirit within that draws them to the righteousness of God. And God said, you have a scepter. Hold it out. Let people know of the content and the quality and the beauty and the essence of the kingdom of which we live in. Where those who would say church is not a viable option, I would beg to differ. But instead of arguing with them about it, let's just show them the difference of the kingdom. Can I get an amen on that? Let's show them the difference. The kingdom is a wonderful kingdom in spite of the people we go to church with. <laughs> By the way, uh, I was talking to Dr. Clayton one time. He's not here. I, I, uh, Dr. Clayton is a source of wisdom. And uh, uh, we've prayed for him. I asked him one day, because he, he pastored uh, uh, Greenwood Village Baptist Church for 30-some years. And I asked him, I said, Dr. Clayton, how did you do I mean, that the, the same church? I mean, did you ever want to... You know, did, you, did you love those people? Of course I love them. So did you ever want to kill those people? Oh, yes, I wanted to kill them all. <laughs> of course, it's always in Jesus' name, as you know. I said, Dr. Clayton, I said, uh, so did you, I, I, said I, I just never have been able to really get past, personally, of, of just the changing of people all the time. I struggle with that. And... Uh, he kind of laughed. He said, yeah, he said, I pastored Greenwood. He said, but I actually pastored about six churches. <laughs> and I kind of giggled and laughed, and I said, okay, don't say anymore. I get it. I get it. You know, we, we love the Lord. We love church. Sometimes we just don't love the people in the church. But by the way, isn't that the quandary of the kingdom? That's what the world doesn't understand. That, that's part of the righteousness of the kingdom that the world doesn't get. Listen, God says has a commandment for you and I. At its very base, God demands us to love each other. See, in spite of your problems, in spite of your hypocrisies, in spite of your personality, in spite of your preferences, in spite of your attitude, in spite of your bitterness, and in spite of your lack of forgiveness, and even with your passion for God, and even with your desire to love God, God says you have to love each other. Do it because I commanded you. But the better thing is, do it because you're righteous. Do it because you're righteous. Of a kingdom of which we live. It's an enjoyable place. I love church. I, I, love, I love you. I love the body of Christ. And I want to give myself to you. And I hope you'll give yourself to me and other people. Because the kingdom, who knows of what you've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. For a kingdom of righteousness is the scepter of the kingdom. You and I hold, out a, hold an interesting place where we have within our disposal authority given to us by the king himself, a responsibility so grave and so serious that God requests us to do it for the rest of our life and that we do it without any question and without any turning back and without any hesitation that we take the good news of the kingdom of God 
and we hold out the scepter to the men and women of our world. And we tell them, like any king, I accept you for who you are. I accept you for what you are. I accept you for what you've done. By the way, let's remind ourselves, before we could ever hold the scepter out, we had to come before the presence of the king, and the king had to extend his scepter to us. There's a wonderful imagery in the book of Esther there, chapter 4, chapter 5, about verse 2. Esther comes before the king. The Bible says that the king showed favor. By the way, you know what the word favor in Esther is the mirror image of? It's grace. He had grace and favor and benevolence. And I can imagine King Ahasuerus, oh, Esther's in the courtroom. Esther's in the king's room, in his throne room. Where's the scepter? Bring me the scepter. I haven't used it in 30 days. I've killed 400 people. But not this one. Not this one. Bring me the scepter. Do it now. Do it quickly. Gather in the scepter. The Bible showed, said he shows favor to Esther. Unannounced, unworthy, worthy of death. I hold out the scepter to you. And Esther, in her humility, Esther, it describes that she reaches up and I can see it. I can see my own salvation, folks. I remember when God held the scepter out to me and I reached out with faith and I took the tip of the scepter and I believed it unto salvation. God held the scepter out to me. And like Esther, I reached unto God. And my belief was strong. Oh, have mercy on me, oh God. Even though you have the power of death within your grasp, I beg mercy and I beg you to hand out your righteousness and mercy unto me. Esther grabs the tip of the scepter, a symbol of I accept your offer. God God puts us in a unique place as the church to tell a world who doesn't want to hear, to tell people that are changing their stance that uh, there's an offer. There's an offer. You see, the scepter is as much an invitation and an offer as it is mercy. The scepter says to the individual, Tell me your need. Tell me your concern. Tell me your problems. Tell me what you want. And like Esther, have mercy on my people. Listen, for lost men to know that there's an offer of a scepter of righteousness and a kingdom so great and so powerful that they know there's an invitation that if I'll but accept the offer of the kingdom that I too can be saved and I too can join in something so powerful and so great that it's worthy of my every breath and life to give it unto God. Amen. There's an offer of righteousness an offer of a kingdom. Our kingdom and the offer of the scepter is an offer of equality. Listen to this now. It's an offer of equality. You see, the world in which we live is telling us that they're redefining equality. They're telling us that what God calls sin, that now is okay, and that we have to accept that. Listen, the kingdom of God's righteousness does not accept that. On the other hand, on the other hand, hear me now, God, God takes some of those very same people, the people that, that basically are blasphemous before God, people that, that throw water in the face of an almighty king. It's the same God who to those very same people extends a scepter and says, I am no respecter of persons. I mean, it's not about your sin. It's about my power. It's not about what you've done. It's not about where you've come from. It's not about what you have done and what you'll do in the future. It's a scepter of righteousness that God says it's an equality thing. I'll, I'll save those who need saving. It's an offer. You see, God doesn't make it out to be about skin color. Aren't you glad about that? Because last time I checked, even Jesus Christ himself was not a white man. We've made Jesus out to be a white man. Well, we've made Christ in so many cases about ethnicity or race. And God says, you know, I love the Jew and the Greek. 
I love the barbarian and the Scythian. I mean, I love, I love the wicked one, and I love those who don't think they're wicked. I love them all. And the offer of the scepter is an offer of equality. It doesn't matter who you are. I'll take you all in. That's why John says, whosoever believeth in the name of the Father. In the end, it's what our offer is. Listen to me, folks. We have an offer of the kingdom to those who do not look like we do. Can I get an amen? We have an offer to anybody who will take it. We have an invitation. By the way, we, we typically fill in here. We have an invitation to the drunkard and to the drug addict and to the whoremonger. Amen? To the perverted. That's typically what we want to look at. Corinthians says, and such were some of you. When you were that way, Romans 5, 8, God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. And that while we were like some of those very same people, God gave us an offer of a scepter. It's an offer of equality. It's an offer of grace that we'll love you no matter what. Can I just say something this morning? You know why, uh, why I believe personally, why America and this up, up and coming generation basically has no interest in, in church or religion. You know why I think that is? Because often they don't see the church sacrificing enough to love them where they are. Amen. To love them where they are. Oftentimes churches have the mentality that we want people to jump through 13 hoops before they can join our church. Or even come to our church. I've heard the horror stories of people who, uh, who come to church and they're, you know, they're strung out on drugs or whatever, fill in the blank, it doesn't matter, and they show up at church and nobody talks to them. And nobody will extend an offer of love and grace and patience and kindness and gentleness unto that person. God, help us as a church that if God were, God forbid, that he would bring the adulterous woman into our church. Or bring the, the, the maimed and the halt and the blind. That he'd bring them into our church and we would not love them the way God loves them. God help us with that. By the way, that sounds a little bit like the Laodicean church, doesn't it? Come on now, you're with me this morning. You see, the point is that we have a scepter in our hand. And we can make an offer. Come as you are. For the God in which we love and believe can take you where you are and change you to be like him no matter what you're like. And the offer is to no matter who you are, black, white, red or brown, sinner or clean, sinner or hypocrite, doesn't matter. And in the end, God says it's a God, it's a kingdom of justice. Let me fit one final point. The scepter is a scepter of justice. Here's the issue. The kingdom of righteousness and a scepter of justice means that God will extend an offer if you'll take it, and if you'll take it, it's freely yours. But hear this now, it will not always be there. There's a point in time when God says, that's it. There, there comes a time when the offer is rescinded. That God says, you have made your choice. Luckily for us, that according to the scriptures, you have almost a lifetime to make your choice. You just rebel and turn your heart on God and blaspheme God. Listen, that's a, maybe a different story. But for 99.9% .9 of the population on the earth, the offer is good for as long as you have breath in your lungs. But there comes a time when God says, that's it. No more. Now here's the kingdom of justice. God said, I will show you mercy no matter where you're coming from. But here's the, here's the real truth that if you choose not to believe, my same scepter will require your life. It'll require your life. Luke chapter 20, verse 17 and 18, talks about the stone, Jesus Christ, that those that fear him, he can break them into pieces, but, but basically he says, fear when the stone falls in wrath on judgment of sin, that the stone of Christ would fall on their life. He will grind them to powder. 
At the time of the wrath of God and the judgment of God carried about on the unbelievers, it's as if the stone of Christ, the scepter now, becomes the battering ram and the grinding stone of God's wrath on the sin of man. God says that the offer is there. The scepter has the ability to do whatever he chooses. But in the end of time, it will grind men's rebellion to powder. And his justice, as much as he loves us, he will cast men into hell because of his power and his authority. So we hold a unique place. We have a scepter in our hand. Let me use my Bible because it's a pretty good scepter. We have a scepter in our hands. And the Lord says, I have anointed my son, verse 9, Hebrews 1. I have anointed him with the oil of gladness. It's the anointing oil of Almighty God and Almighty King with the anointing oil of joy. And God said he has an offer. And I would challenge you as a church, although we're living in a place that seems to be turning its back, we're living in a place where people think the church is not valid, we're living in a time when the church seems to be losing its power and efficiency and effectiveness, I, got, I believe God's calling us this morning to grab a hold of the scepter of God, make an offer to the world, and believe in what God has given to you. Believe it. Give yourself to it. Give yourself in sacrifice. Rearrange your life in such a way that will allow you to invest in the work of God. Rearrange your priorities so that you can pick up the scepter and tell men of the wonderful offer of Jesus Christ and a kingdom so powerful and so beautiful that they'll never regret their decision. Can I get an amen? Father, thank you for the wonderful truth of the scepter. Father, we want to pick it up we want to believe in it. And Father, we want to thank you for giving to us the wonderful truth of our King. Father, we are needy. Father, we uh, thank you for teaching us about your kingdom. And Father, for such a time as this, oh, Father, we would take up the scepter and share the truth with men. Share the truth with the world in which we live. And Father, that our own lives would be affected by our belief in the wonderful, powerful scepter of God. Thank you, Lord, for the truth now. Lord, pry into our hearts. Lord, help our tenderness to be responsive, immediate and effective, Lord. Help us even now, God, to take it up, Lord, and share with those around us. We love you now. Have your will away in every heart and life. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.